Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk on a multi-purpose cloud file system. So I'm going to give a talk today about the business case of why we built this file system and also share with you the design and architecture of this file system. My name is Sazala. I want to just share a little bit background about my storage experiences. I was at three, three different storage companies. The last one I was at is uh, this company called Datrium. Here's the team I worked with. We were acquired by VMware last year. The reason I'm showing you this is because I want to share some thoughts on technology and business about storage. The first thing is that why would I work in storage across all these different companies? It's because, number one, is that it's a big market. It's a $100 billion plus market, and there's many, many different use cases to go solve, so you can definitely easily build a business around it. And then number two, lesson I've learned is watching all different, different kind of storage companies across time is that file systems once designed and you have customer data on it, they're very hard to change your fundamental architecture. So what happens is that every few years, there's a new use case or a new media which comes up. These file systems are, will be a, a kind of hard to adapt to these new, new, new scenarios. And hence, every few years, you see a, a new bunch of new startup companies in storage business to kind of take on to these new use cases. For example, Kubernetes is a new thing. And there are now a set of storage companies trying to address the use case for Kubernetes specifically. So that's why I think it's a, it's a, it's a big market, it's a useful market. I'll share a little bit more about uh, how to think about this from a business angle when I actually have any time in the end of this presentation. So let's jump into it. So most when we think of DR, when I mean by DR is disaster recovery. When we talk about disaster recovery, every business needs it because they have to consider a disaster happening to the data center and how do they kind of recover from that. And when we think of disasters, generally we think about natural hurricanes or fires, things like that. Those are legit. But more and more, the top two most interesting disaster scenarios are ransomware and power outages. And people need to deal with it. Otherwise, your whole business is down. Customers are down. So it's a super important problem for every business. So why do we find this problem interesting? It's because... The, for example, the traditional on-prem data center way of doing uh, DR is very expensive, it's very complex, and really doesn't really work well. I've met no customer who has said that DR is awesome. So let me show you why that is so. So firstly, in a data center, you know, you run your workloads, you, you, know, you first have to buy some servers, you put some, uh, run some work VMs, workloads on your servers, you put VMware, and VMware is deployed widely across the data center, um, data centers across the globe, and then, you have to then buy some storage, sand storage to run to actually hold the data and run your workloads as well. So that's step one. And the step two is that then you have to consider how do I do backups? And then you end up having to buy a whole lot of stuff, gear, to do your backups. And part of that is backup software running in some servers. You gotta buy backs, backup arrays, backup boxes to store all the data. And then you sometimes people also do offsite tape. So this is on your primary data center. Now, if this data center goes down, so you have to consider how do I get my data off to the other side? So most, most, most businesses have a second data center. It's called the disaster recovery DR site. And then they replicate all the, all the boxes on the left, all the infrastructure onto the right. And so they have to maintain all of this stuff. So the complexity is that it's a large footprint. There's so many different boxes and vendors you have to deal with. And you know, all these pieces come from different, different vendors. And they all together, it's Murphy's Law. When you have a failure, you're hoping this all work for you. So it becomes very fragile, and then you end up not being able to have a reliable solution. So this complexity ultimately results in, you don't test it very often because it's too complex. And then, then it, become less, it becomes less reliable. In fact, I had a customer who told me he prays there is no disaster, but if there is one, he hopes he dies in it because he doesn't want to deal with it. I know it sounds funny, but also sounds, sounds sad at the same point. So clearly, if you look at the picture here, there's an opportunity to kind of solve this in a simpler and easy way. The pain is huge, opportunity is also big. So what we have done is that we've taken all that complexity and we have converted it into a simple uh, SaaS-based solution. And I will show you how that works and, and, and also the file system we built for that use case. So now I'll give you a brief description of how it works. So we call it VMware Cloud Disaster Recovery, on-demand disaster recovery as a service. Firstly, you know, you have a set of workloads on your on-prem, you're running some workloads that like I showed you before, it's uh, and some VMs. And what we are offering our service is that we have these two cloud-based SaaS services. One is the orchestrator, think of it as a control plane which manages things. And then we have our scale-out file system running in the cloud. So in steady state, the customer downloads a, our lightweight software onto their data center uh, clusters. 
and then they set up policies to do incremental backups steadily into the cloud file system. So in steady state, people expect this to be low cost. So what we have designed our file system is that in steady state, when there's nothing really going on other than these backups, it's, it's super low cost and super efficient and we have storing data. But when there is a disaster in your data center, you don't have to have a second data center. You don't have to have anything running. Our, our services will launch a VMware clusters on demand in the cloud, and you only pay for them when you have a disaster. And then we'll automatically be able to launch the workloads directly from our file system into the VMware clusters. So in steady state, it has got to be cheap and low cost. And then when there is a disaster, it has to be really high performance and be able to run the workloads. So this, this, so this dichotomy of having a file system which does both low cost and be able to high performance is kind of the crux of our file system, and which is why we call it a multi-purpose file system. And then when you're done with your uh, disaster, like most, in most cases, your data center is not dead. You can then click a button. It will only bring back the changes which are uh, kind of changed in the last couple of weeks, perhaps, maybe a couple of days, and then you're good to go from where you left off. So that's kind of what we offer, what we mean by disaster recovery uh, the service. Shut down your second data center and leverage the SaaS solution to simplify your uh, all the boxes I just showed you, we're taking the, all, all the pain away into the simple solution. So no, no, now let me, so this is the business case. This is kind of what we built. And that's the, the file system is unique in the sense that you have to kind of solve this low cost solution in steady state, but also be high performance at, uh, when you need to. So let me show you how we did that. And I'll go into the design overview of our scalar file system. So think of it as a, just a big giant uh, black box or a purple box, like my color shirt. Um, the features we wanted were some foundational things. We wanted it to be low cost. You know, clearly it matters in steady state. We wanted it to be high performance, low latency, so that you know it really uh, shines when you run workloads. But besides that, just storage and high performance. We also care a lot about data management. When we mean data management, what we mean is snapshots, clones. You know, be able to do 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 those kinds of uh, higher level uh, operations on the file systems, and it runs on Amazon. So the first thing we did was, how do we store data into our file system? So we use a technique called content addressable uh, techniques. What it means is that when data comes into our system, to our file system, we are able to take all the data, clump it, we call it clumps, and we're able to break it down into smaller, smaller blocks and store it into the file system. So we call them clumps, it was a clever name we thought. And it's a variable size blocks. And the way we find variable size, the boundaries is using some temporal and spatial locality algorithms. And that's how we find these variable sized boundaries for these clumps. And they're variable size from one byte to 64K. That's kind of what we picked as our best for doing deduplication, for example. And then think of our file system as this giant pool of clumps and they all dedupe together so that you get space efficiencies and cost efficiencies. And each clump is referred by a crypto hash, a fingerprint is what I, what I call it. And that's just kind of what makes it into a content addressable system. This is what we mean. Content is addressable by this fingerprint and crypto hash. The advantages are that it becomes, the system becomes so much simpler because the only dealing with is these clumps and the crypto hash fingerprints. And you can also do dedupe because you can, this giant pool is easy to dedupe. Uh, and also then you get, we, we decided not to use reference counts. It makes it much simpler to, use, to have a system like this. So it's a giant pool of clumps. Think of it that way. The next problem is that um, these clumps, where do we store? So if you store it on S3, which is cost efficient, the problem with S3 is that it does not like the small objects that much in the sense that it's costly, it's slow. There's latency issues in writing such small objects to S3. And also it costs money to do put and gets. So what we have done is that we have taken these clumps and packaged them into these eight megabyte S3 objects. So we use a technique from a paper from 1992 called Log Structure File System. It's by Mendel Rosenblum. He's the founder of VMware. And the main theory is that converting ran small random blocks and converting them into large sequential logs onto the disk. So that is kind of the high level idea of what we have done. So we take all these small, small clumps, package them, compress them, package them into this eight megabyte S3 block, S3 objects and put it into S3. It's super high, highly high performance because S3 is really good at, uh, at, at sequential IO, and that's what we're taking advantage of. The advantage of LFS, also other thing we have done is that we use um, garbage collection techniques, distributed garbage collection to, 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 uh, to clean up the data from these logs once in a while. The advantages are, are that it's very high performance, 
And you can do very uh, cool snap way of doing snapshots with this LFS uh, as a foundation. So at this point, what I just showed you with these clumps and then the S3 storage is just a way to store objects and way to store data in a large scale and easy to, easy to manage uh, kind of a file system. But it's still very dumb, it's just storing data. What we have done on top of that is that we wanted data management. We wanted the ability to cust users and customers to be able to use different ways of managing the data and be able to do snapshots and clones and very efficiently and rapidly as well. So we use something we call uh, LSM trees in log structure merge trees. These were kind of uh, paper in 1994. They're right optimized trees, and this is what we use for a foundation for data management. The advantage are that we are able to do millions of snapshots, millions of clones whenever we want to. This is kind of what is really uh, helps customers when they have to do test and dev and they have to do recover from ransomware or other activities like that. So we have storage. On top of that, we built this foundation for data management. And the way it's structured is that the, all the data is on S3 and all the snapshots data is all on S3. And S3 is awesome in terms of scalability, in terms of durability, it's durable across AZs. So that's taken care of. If there was not there, we have to build our own, but S3 is there, which is what we kind of really liked. Uh, it is weird in some sense, but if we can take advantage of it, it's, it's really great. And on top of that, what we have is that we have an elastic way of scaling our compute. So we use EC2. EC2 is uh, Amazon's uh, name for compute clusters. We use EC2 with local NVMe storage, and these are all read caches only, so that if you lose one of these nodes, it's not a big deal. So we are able to scale our performance by adding or shrinking this elastic uh, EC2 clusters with local caching. We can get really high performance, or we can go, we can get to really low performance. So we're able to scale performance and capacity independently, which is really useful for our business because like I just showed you for the DR use case, we can steady state, we can be on S3, super low cost, and when there is a really a need to run workloads at high performance, we can launch these EC2 instances instant instantaneously, as many as we want, depending on the use case, and run workloads at high performance. So that is the high level crux of how our file system is structured. So let me summarize the kind of the layers I just showed you, the different, different layers into this one slide. And really what we're trying to do is deliver low cost and fast recovery. Basically, this is what we mean by multi-purpose file system is ability to do this, have this different, different personas when we need to. And the way we've designed it is that all these different things I just showed you is that we built it as layers. And the reasoning is that when we build this as layers, you know, each layer is a solid foundation to build upon. And if you have a new use case, we can plug in a different layer at each of these slots so that we get, you know, it's gonna kind of go up challenge and, and tackle on uh, different use cases. But the, use, but, the, but the layers that I just showed you, I'm gonna talk about them first. And uh, so at the bottom of our file system is this object manager, which is what I've been calling the content addressable storage technique. And this is how we are able to manage all of our data. It's all fingerprint based, it's all crypto hashes so that every, all the software we use just has to refer to fingerprints, doesn't have to worry about how, how, the, how the data is being laid out onto, onto the disk. And also we use S3 as our foundations. And like I mentioned before, so it also basically is AZ fault tolerant. S3 is amazing, it's very durable. And that gives us the chance that we don't have to build anything ourselves on like, you know, like a foundation, it's already there, we use it. And it's also AZ fault tolerant. And that foundation layer on top of that is what we built the LFS, which is what I showed you before, is that we convert random writes into sequential logs and it really, really works well on object storage. And that gives us a good solid foundation at this point, these two layers to have a solid, scalable, high performance and low cost storage system. You can store anything you want in it. The next thing we added was the LSM trees, which is what we call, we call it snap store as a way to, as a database internally to manage the snapshots and keep track of all of these uh, objects. The idea is that customers can clone, can, can keep as many snapshots as they want, uh, as long as they want to for long-term retention at low cost. And on top of that is the elastic uh, distributed NFS read caching so that we are able to run workloads when we need to at really, really high performance and low latency. It's a global namespace across the cluster so that you get one view no matter how you talk to the system. And so that's the kind of the layering we have approached. Uh, and this is kind of why the bottom layers give us a low cost uh, element of storing data and the upper upper layer give us, gives us this uh, really, really high performance when we need to run the workloads. This is kind of why we call it a multi-purpose file system. This, 
the the it's a pretty unique file system and it specifically kind of really works well for disaster recovery because of the low cost and the fast recovery uh, aspects of it. But this is not sufficient. Um, we added, we think that data integrity is really important. I'm sure you know this is working storage. You cannot lose data. People expect that, you know, you ha you're going to save the data forever. So rather than customers checking the data, we have built in uh, checks to verify the data integrity every day. And we felt it necessary to give us confidence and give customers confidence that this is going to work and last for, for a really long time. And again, data integrity is not one thing we do. It's a, it's a bunch of different things, uh, techniques we have applied to get really good data integrity um, into our system. And it's not an afterthought. It's a process we kind of think thought about as we're designing the whole system. So it's a belt and suspenders technique. Multiple techniques have been used to make this actually uh, kind of have this, uh, this foundation. So I'll go through them quickly. So one is that at the bottom, we have immutable objects. And what it means is that the crypto hash is super strong checksums for the data, and they kind of go together, and they're not changeable uh, as the foundation. The second thing is that, because you know LFS, by the way, I really love LFS. It's, it has really, really uh, strong properties, and it's like a Christmas tree. You can talk about it all day. And one of the things it, ha it is cool also, besides just doing uh, sequential logs, is that it writes into new places. And what that means is that you're not corrupting your old data. You're writing into new places. It gives you a fundamentally a good property that you're not going to be corrupting your data, the old data at least, and always going into new places. That's a very, very powerful property of LFS. And the LSM trees we use to manage our metadata and all our snapshots, we not only verify the integrity of the LSM tree itself, but that's not sufficient. We want to make sure that all the things it points to, the LSM tree points to all these different objects, that they're also very good in good shape. So we do a full reference integrity checks across the whole LSM trees and the data to make sure that everything is live and everything actually is, is well connected together. And, and then lastly, because of ransomware concerns and people deleting snapshots, because when you have ransomware attack, you want to go back to your snapshots to recover, our snapshots are hidden. They are not visible outside. And you must do special actions to be make it to make to be cloning from the snapshots. And also snapshots are immutable. If you want to work on a snapshot, you clone it and you work on it. You can't change the snapshot fundamentally. And this is really useful for compliance and because people want to keep data for a long time and also because of ransomware and uh, such uh, virus act related activities. So we believe data integrity job number one. I'm sure you do as well if you're in storage. Got a little extra gray hair thinking about data integrity. Um, so the high level, we're pretty proud of the file system we built. But also the things I've learned is that you know, building is one thing. And then selling is the uh, kind of the other thing. So selling is as, as, is as hard as actually building a file system. And I wanted to give a little bit more a perspective on selling the, how to sell this uh, in a file system or anything, in fact, to customers or to, you know, your peers or to your managers. If you want to build something, you got to make a case for it. So the thing I've learned is that over time, by good and bad experiences, I've learned some hard knocks along the way. And... The, I've come to the conclusion that there is a simple way to think about this and how, we, how, we, how are you going to sell this? Maybe even before you're building it, you got to consider this, this angle to it if you're going to go sell to somebody. So it's kind of distilled down to those three whys of the customer buyer's journey. And it applies to anybody in, on, on, on any topic. The first thing is, why should the customer buy anything? Why should your peer or anybody, why should they even change what they're doing? Why should they buy into your idea on what you're trying to solve? The example is, um, is that... People are going to buy something and change something in the in the environment if there is a big shift happening in the in the industry or if there's a negative impact if they don't change. So I'll give you two examples. One example, a generic you know example in life is that if you're going to have a baby, if you're going to if you're about to have a baby, you will consider buying a minivan. So that is a life change, a big impact, and you are thinking of buying a minivan. Before that, you didn't consider, but now you do. So that so in, so the question about why buy anything that's changed. And for the business case, I am talking about the DR, disaster recovery. Why buy anything now is that a lot of companies are trying to shift to the cloud. And, and then it's very complex DR, especially given that digital transformation, people really care about making it simplification. So that's why people are considering changing their existing legacy way of doing it into a new way of doing it. So they're considering it because it's a powerful force. People want to go to the cloud. People want to have a simpler way of doing disaster recovery. The second question, which is also important, is why buy now? Like, yeah, everybody thinks that one day I'll do it, but why should you buy it now? The 
buy buy now is because it's a critical initiative there's a deadline i gotta i gotta have incentive to act right now i gotta go buy it so in the example of uh the minivan the baby is coming in a month you gotta buy it you gotta have make a decision very soon you gotta buy it and in the disaster recovery use case there's ransomware ransomware is hot top you know it's a very it's a very deadly thing you can hit anybody at any time so you must act now to go fix your problems and be ready for ransomware attacks so that's a why buy now and the third thing is why should they buy your product why should they buy my product and that's when you have to kind of have a new approach uh, or some unique value uh, you're offering to the customer. It, could, it just can't be better. Better is kind of sub very subjective compared to, you know, two different products. What you want is something different and which is calls a problem, which takes the customer into a new place. And for the minivan use case, you know, you can be able to compare between Chrysler or Honda, and particularly in our case, disaster recovery. We are solving it in a different way. We have converted this complex hardware-based boxes, multiple boxes, multiple vendors into a simple one-click, simple-to-use SaaS solution in the cloud. And they can shut down the second data center. It's a very unique offering. Nobody has done this because it's also unique because it requires this multi-purpose file system to actually solve a disaster recovery problem, which nobody has really built. And that's why it's unique. And that's why customers are really liking our product to go buy. So hopefully together, I have given you a sense of the, you know, how to think of business case, how to go sell it to your peers or to customers and before you actually build anything and also a thought process into kind of how to uh, uh, build a cloud-based file system, at least for the use cases we are considering. Thank you. Thank you very much.